All right, part two of this lecture will cover um, the rest of ischemic strokes, focusing on small vessel strokes. Then we'll get into uh, mainly hemorrhagic strokes, and we'll say a little bit about cerebral venous thrombosis. So small vessel strokes or lacunar strokes are very common, um, and these are due to occlusion of these small penetrating arteries, like the lenticulostriate or the thalamogeniculate that we talked about last year. And so the strokes are smaller than two centimeters. And in general, the rule of thumb with lacunar strokes is that patients have one specific deficit, which can be quite profound, but they don't have the whole multitude of problems that someone with a large vessel stroke will have. So they don't have um, large vessel symptoms, which would be, for example, aphasia, that we see with an MCA stroke or homonymous hemianopsia that we'd see with an MCA or a PCA stroke, anosognosia with a right MCA stroke. In general, motor and sensory loss together in the same limb, uh, if it's a stroke in the brain, suggests it's more likely to be a large vessel stroke. All right, so if we have just a specific focal deficit, that's going to be a lacunar stroke. And so the risk factors are things that affect small penetrating blood vessels. So hypertension and diabetes are the two most common risk factors. So the most common of all is pure motor stroke. And I think most students um, at the end of the third year neurology clerkship um, have all seen someone that has a pure motor stroke, very common. And so patients present with weakness, and again, it's a stroke, so it comes on suddenly, and it involves the opposite face, arm, and leg. Okay, so the anatomy of this here is uh, the blood vessel is the lenticulostriate branch of the middle cerebral artery, and this supplies uh, the motor fibers in the posterior limb of the internal capsule as well as the genu of the internal capsule. Okay, so um, this is kind of what a, a symptomatic uh, lacunar stroke uh, looks like here on MRI scan. And so uh, last time we talked about here the middle cerebral artery coming off of the internal carotid, and so it supplies the lateral hemisphere of the brain. But on the way through the sylvian fissure, we have these penetrating branches or lenticulostriate branches of the middle cerebral artery. So it's an occlusion of you know one of these that is going to give the pure motor stroke. And so coming back to a diagram from uh, the first year, so here's the internal capsule, all right? So in the posterior limb, we have the cortical spinal tract, okay? And at the genu, we have the cortical bulbar tract. So the ischemia here involves the posterior limb. That gives you the contralateral arm and leg weakness. And the involvement here at the genu will give the patient the facial weakness. And remember, this is an upper motor neuron facial weakness, so it's just going to be the lower face that's going to be affected. Now, pure sensory stroke is an occlusion now of the thalamogeniculate um, ar arterial branches that come off of the posterior cerebral artery. So this is a posterior circulation stroke. And here the stroke is most often in the thalamus. And so patients present with sudden, they'll complain of numbness and tingling on one side of the body, face, arm, and leg. Okay, and so the thalamic nuclei are VPM and VPL. So remember, VPM is a thalamic nucleus for the face, VPL for the arm and leg. So on examination, they're going to have a loss of sensation to all modalities, pain, temperature, vibration, proprioception on the opposite side of the body. But they have no weakness. Okay, so again, there's the blood vessel, thalamogeniculate. So the, the stroke here usually is in the thalamus, okay, VPM, VPL. Occasionally, the stroke can be in the posterior limb involving the uh, superior sensory radiations. Because remember, when all sensation synapses here in the thalamus, but then it has to get up to the postcentral gyrus. And so it gets there through these superior thalamic radiations, which travel in the posterior limb right next to the cortical spinal tract, but it's a different vascular territory. It's posterior circulation. So again, if you had to choose, always put the lesion in the thalamus, uh, much, much more likely. Okay, and so here's an MRI. We can see nicely the internal capsule. So again, 
Our pure motor stroke is here. Our pure sensory stroke is usually in the thalamus. Now, hemibolismus, which we talked about last year, is a stroke involving the subthalamic nucleus, which, remember, is a very important part of basal ganglia circuitry for normal movement. So patients present with sudden onset, ballistic, wild, flinging movements on the opposite side of the body. And so here's a coronal section um, that you've seen before. And so we have the midbrain here, which we know it's the midbrain because we can see um, here the substantia nigra. Here's the cerebral peduncle. And so just kind of above and lateral to the substantia nigra, we have the subthalamic nucleus. Here we can see nicely a football-shaped nucleus. And so if we have a lesion there, it disrupts this basal ganglia circuitry. So remember, we have the putamen, globus pallidus out here. Um, here's the caudate nucleus, subthalamic nucleus. And so, uh, again, it's um, a movement disorder. But uh, like our other two examples, it's just one deficit. So it's pure motor weakness, pure sensory loss, or in this case, a pure movement disorder. But nothing else. They don't have an aphasia, a visual field deficit, um, and all of that. So that should always suggest a lacunar small vessel stroke. Now, unfortunately, even though I told you the rule of thumb is that if patients have motor and sensory loss together on one side of the body, it's usually a cortical stroke, but occasionally someone can have um, a stroke um, in the internal capsule and there's a little swelling, edema around it, and so it can, we can involve motor and sensory fibers. So patients can have some motor and sensory loss um, together. Uh, but again, if, if it, let's say a patient presents with right-sided weakness and sensory loss, well, if it's left hemisphere, like an MCA stroke, they should have an aphasia, they should have a homonymous hemianopsia, and so on. And if they lack all of those other things, then it probably is a um, small vessel stroke in the internal capsule. There are other small vessel stroke syndromes, um, but I think uh, we'll, we'll leave it at that for now. If someone has many, many subcortical small vessel strokes and you just kind of chip away at the cortical bulbar tract, over time, patients may develop this pseudobulbar palsy. Okay, and now we've come to the full list of differential for pseudobulbar palsy. Okay, and so lots of subcortical strokes, and because of that, they're going to have some focal findings, right? They're going to have a little hemiplegia over time because of all of the strokes that have developed. And if you just disrupt a lot of the subcortical circuitry of the brain, there's going to be some degree of dementia. And so the, what has the in common for all the different etiologies of pseudobulbar palsy is the pathways involved is the cortical bulbar tract. All right, so here's our differential. Multiple sclerosis, um, again, you have demyelination of the cortical bulbar tract, but it's going to be a younger patient with sort of a relapsing, remitting course. ALS, um, where it's motor neuron disease, right? The neurons in the brain that contribute to the cortical bulbar tract degenerate. So these patients have progressive upper and lower motor neuron findings, fasciculations. Um, two conditions in our differential of Parkinson's disease, progressive nuclear, nuclear palsy and multisystem atrophy. Um, these patients uh, quite often have pseudobulbar palsy. So remember, it's Parkinsonism. And if they have PSP, among other things, they have that vertical eye movement abnormality. If it's multi-system atrophy, they have a very early presentation with orthostasis. They're passing out when they stand up. Okay, and then finally here in this handout, multiple subcortical strokes. So here the story is an older, what we'll call a vasculopathic patient. Lots of vascular risk factors, previous strokes. Okay, and so this can be really severe. I've seen patients that present, you know, they've had several strokes, but then they just have one more, and so it knocks out enough of the cortical bulbar tract that they may not even be able to speak because they have none of the cortical bulbar tract able to communicate with the uh, areas in the medulla, like nucleus ambiguous, that would allow them to talk. And so it can even look like a Broca's aphasia um, in a very severe case. And so remember, pseudobulbar palsy, they also have that emotional incontinence and always very profound uh, dysarthria and dysphagia.
Now, if we have uh, just a global uh, hypotensive event, so let's say someone has a cardiac arrest and they have CPR, and you know it takes it a lot of um, you know to bring them back. It's a prolonged um, event, hypoxic event. You need to remember that there are certain areas of the brain that are susceptible to ischemia. And so Dr. Deich told you about uh, Sumner's sector in the hippocampus, the Purkinje cells here in the cerebellum are more likely to be damaged by ischemia. Um, but really important that you remember it's the watershed areas of the brain that often produce our distinctive uh, syndrome here from a hypotensive stroke. So. Um, there's a just somewhat less perfusion at these junctions between middle and anterior cerebral artery vascular territories. So we can have a stroke here, or we can have a stroke back here between the middle cerebral artery and the posterior cerebral artery. Within the vascular territory of the middle cerebral artery, there is a watershed area between more proximal and more distal portions of the middle cerebral artery. And so this is uh, what's called the MCA border zone right here. Okay, and so um, again, someone's coming around after their code, and they may have some deficits. You do a brain scan, and you might see something like this. So again, here's that sort of border zone of the middle cerebral artery. So this is would be classic uh, for a hyperten hypotensive stroke. And these patients have a very unique presentation. Um, the areas that are affected tend to be not out here in the face and hand, or down in the foot, it's the more proximal muscles for both the arm and the leg that are affected. And so uh, what we usually see here is, you know, the patient's been unresponsive for a while. We didn't know if they were going to pull through. And then they start to wake up. And what you'll notice is they have pretty good strength in their hands and feet, but their proximal muscles um, are very weak. And so this is called man in a barrel syndrome or person in a barrel syndrome. Um, and comes on acutely after a hypotensive event, and um, uh, that's because of this border zone here within the middle cerebral artery. All right, so I'm just going to say a few things about treatment, and I will not ask you about any of this on the upcoming exam because, um, um, again, the, the management issues we really get into in the third year clerkship, but I find it kind of unsatisfying not to say anything about all the progress that has been made in recent years in terms of treatment of stroke. So just kind of relax here as we go through this. So TPA or alteplase has been around for quite a while. And basically, um, in lay terms, these are clot-busting type medications. It binds to fibrin, triggers local fibrinolysis. And the sooner you can give these, the better. And so we, we want to give this... Um, you know, if someone's in the hospital, that makes it easy. You can, you know, get your workup done and um, quickly and then give this medication. The window is up to 4.5 hours, okay? But the longer you get to 4.5 hours, the less likely you are to have that really excellent response. And so just as a practical matter, this happens all the time. Someone wakes up with a stroke and they get rushed to the emergency room and we do all of our workup. Quickly, let's say within less than an hour, you know, can we give TPA in that situation? No, because you need to know when the patient was last normal. Okay, so if they got up, you know, an hour before uh, waking up to go to the bathroom and they were normal, well, that's their last normal. And then maybe you could give TPA, but if they slept through the night for eight hours and then woke up, um, you can't give it. So we always need to know when was the last normal because. Um, there are risks of giving TPA um, if it's later into the stroke. And so possibility of hemorrhage and complications are higher um, if you give it later on. And there's no benefit that it's, no proven benefit that it's helpful. Now, thrombectomy, here we can see a thrombectomy where we actually go in and extract the clot. Um, this is a new, very exciting area of stroke treatment. This is clearly beneficial um, up to 24 hours from the onset of a stroke. Now, right now, this is only proven for large vessel anterior circulation strokes, uh, like a, a middle cerebral artery stroke, something like that. Um, but um, this has really become very um, popular for 
primary stroke centers that uh, where patients get referred in, and you've got a larger window uh, for doing that. Um, it's just kind of a basic thing. When someone has a stroke, almost always the blood pressure goes up. And so patients you see in the emergency room that have had a stroke have a high blood pressure. This is the normal response of the brain to try to increase perfusion to the area of the brain that's um, having ischemia. And so um, when we admit someone with a stroke, we don't right away try to normalize their blood pressure. In fact, that can be harmful to try to normalize blood pressure. So we really let it run high, um, very high, for at least 24 hours after a stroke, and then we'll gradually be begin to bring it down. Remember that more than 90% of ischemic strokes are due to lifestyle completely modifiable factors. So once we've you know dealt with the acute phase of the stroke, then we really work on patient education to try to prevent this from happening again. Okay, so aspirin in general, we will start a patient on if it's a stroke that was not cardioembolic. All right, so someone that just has, let's say, pure motor stroke, um, or where, where it's just vascular disease in the brain, we'll give aspirin. And there are, if if the patient has another stroke, despite being on aspirin, there are other medications we can change the patient to, which I won't talk about. Um, if it's a cardioembolic stroke, so someone has atrial fibrillation, for example, um, then we give warfarin. And um, in recent years, there's a whole new generation of non-vitamin K antagonist oral anticoagulants, which are a really good alternative to warfarin. But again, I'm not going to get into that at all. Just to know that we treat um, intracerebral vascular disease stroke different than we treat strokes um, that came from the heart. And so these are um, just preventive. They don't help the patient when they've had their stroke, like TPA or thrombectomy might. They're, it's just to prevent the next stroke. And then if someone has 70% uh, or more narrowing of the internal carotid artery and it's in the symptomatic territory, so they have a right MCA stroke and they have a right 80% internal carotid artery narrowing, then this patient uh, may be a candidate for a carotid endarterectomy, where they sort of scoop out that area of narrowing in the internal carotid artery. So these are just a few little pearls in terms of treatment of stroke. Um, here was a patient that um, I saw not too long ago that uh, was visiting a family member at the VA hospital, had a stroke, and this was a clot. The patient had a thrombectomy, and you can see this really long two and a half centimeter clot um, that was going all the way through the middle cerebral artery that they extracted with the thrombectomy. All right, so let's move on to hemorrhages now. So Overall, the most common hemorrhage in the brain is a subarachnoid hemorrhage due to trauma, but that's usually not much of a mystery. Someone's in a car accident, and you do a CT, and you find a little subarachnoid blood. Um, we have a whole hour lecture on head trauma, and so I'm not going to really get into that too much. But it is very important that you're aware of the hypertensive hemorrhages. These are patients that have a long history of hypertension, usually poorly treated, and this leads to damage of the long penetrating arteries, like the lenticulostriate or the thalamogeniculate. And so the damage to these penetrating blood vessels causes what are called Charcot-Buchard aneurysms. Okay, these are not the saccular or berry aneurysms that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. These are, these are very different aneurysms. Um, and they're of the small blood vessels. So the bleeding is into the parenchyma of the brain itself. It can be very difficult uh, clinically at times to tell the difference between an ischemic stroke and an intracerebral hemorrhage. But one thing that would point you more in the likelihood of hemorrhage is if patients have symptoms of increased intracranial pressure. So that would include a lethargic, confused patient, uh, a lot of nausea and vomiting with the stroke, and if the patient complains of a headache. Now notice in the ischemic strokes, we talked about all kinds of details, but I didn't say anything about headache. And ischemic strokes, if there's a headache, it's not you know really a very big deal. But in an intracerebral hemorrhage, you are now introducing a new volume 
into the brain, unlike an ischemic stroke. And so that has a mass effect, which causes a headache. Okay, and so um, these are some things that would just point you in that direction. But again, sometimes can be quite difficult. And so um, Dr. Deich showed you this one nicely here of the lenticulostrite penetrating blood vessels. So remember, we get our pure motor stroke there. But if we get these tiny little charcot buchard aneurysms, we can see this little out pouching here, and that ruptures and bleeds, um, then we're going to get a hemorrhage um, in that area. So the most common location is the putamen. Okay, remember that's part of the basal ganglia circuitry. And so you might think this is going to present with a movement disorder because the basal ganglia, you know, is involved in movement. But actually the clinical deficits are due to um, distortion of pathways that are around the putamen. So remember the putamen is right next to the internal capsule. And so the posterior limb, um, it tends to be involved by these hemorrhages. So patients have a contralateral hemiplegia and hemisensory loss. The optic radiations, as we'll see, are right in the neighborhood as well, so they often have a contralateral homonymous hemianopsia, and so this overlaps a lot with a middle cerebral artery stroke. But again, look for the headache, um, confused patient, nausea, vomiting as, as something that would help to uh, distinguish that. Okay, and if, you know, it's a very severe increase in cranial pressure, they may lapse into a coma over time. So mortality is about uh, one-third with these. And so here's a putaminal hemorrhage. Remember, on a CT, the only thing that is allowed to be uh, white here, hyperintense, is calcium. Like here's the bone, here's the pineal gland, and an acute hemorrhage. So here we see a putaminal hemorrhage. On the normal side here, we can see the um, internal capsule. So the putamen, globus pallidus, would be out here. The thalamus is right here. And so you can see that this hemorrhage is lateral to the internal capsule here. And so the mass effect here, then pushing on the posterior limb, is why you affect the motor and the sensory fibers. So they get a contralateral hemiplegia, hemisensory loss. Okay, and the optic radiations, remember, come from this low-lying thalamic nucleus, the VPL, and they wrap around like this. And so the optic radiations are also right in the neighborhood, and so you get that contralateral uh, homonymous hemianopsia. Here's another picture of a putaminal hemorrhage right here. A little dark area here is some swelling uh, that's around uh, this hemorrhage. Second most common is a thalamic hemorrhage. So again, it's a story of someone that has high blood pressure for many years. Maybe they don't take their medications or you go through the chart and you see, boy, for the last 10 years, this patient's blood pressure has never been below 160 over 95 or something like that. So, um, but now the, um, this would be a posterior circulation uh, hemorrhage. And so it mainly involves the thalamus. And so early on, they have more sensory loss on the opposite side of the body. But this may extend to involve motor pathways as well. So it can overlap with a putaminal hemorrhage. Um, the thalamus sits right on top of the midbrain. The midbrain, recall, is important for vertical eye movements, looking up and down. So these patients may have impaired ability to look up and down, just like a patient with um, progressive supranuclear palsy. Okay, because I think the thalamus is so much closer to the brainstem than the putamen, if we have a really large thalamic hemorrhage, it can compress the brainstem and therefore the mortality is higher. All right, so um, again, here's the posterior limb of the internal capsule, and now we have a hemorrhage that is medial to that, so this is a thalamic hemorrhage. And we can see some blood here has gone into the ventricular system. We see some blood in the lateral ventricles. Okay, remember the thalamus sits right here on top of the midbrain. And so we've got pressure getting transmitted down like this. Then that may impair vertical eye movements. Next, we have pontine hemorrhage. It has even a higher mortality. And so if you've heard of patients that just... Uh, you know, the story is, well, they just dropped dead. This would be on the list of that because 
the reticular activating system in the pons is quite extensive, so if we have a big hemorrhage there, you knock that out, the patient may lapse into a coma and die. And so if you can you know, talk with a family member or if the patient is awake in the emergency room, you may get a story that initially they complained of nausea, vomiting, a headache, and maybe some other brainstem symptoms. So maybe they had a period of time of uh, double vision or vertigo. Those would be kinds of brainstem symptoms. That would all be compatible with a pontine hemorrhage. So the giveaway, certainly on step one boards, would be pinpoint pupils. Okay, so someone comes into the emergency room, maybe unresponsive, and your examination shows pinpoint pupils. So that is a pontine hemorrhage until proven otherwise. So why do they have pinpoint pupils? Well, this is really a bilateral Horner syndrome. Remember the first part of the three steps, the three neuronal stages here of the connection for the pupil, go, the first one goes from the hypothalamus down to C8T1 of the spinal cord. And so really you knock out the, all of the descending sympathetic fibers, and that's why they have pinpoint pupils. So high mortality and uh, close to 100% if they're comatose at onset. And so here we can see um, a hemorrhage in the pons, and notice this big area here. This is the uh, temporal horn of the lateral ventricle, which is really dilated. And so that tells you the patient has some uh, hydrocephalus. Okay, and on autopsy, obviously a hemorrhage that knocks out this much of the pons is not going to be um, compatible with life. Okay, so we're going in, in order of frequency. So it's butaminal, thalamic, pontine, and the next is the uh, cerebellar. So again, all four of these are hypertensive hemorrhages. This is actually the most important one not to miss because this one's very treatable. And so a, a bleed in the cerebellum, now we get a mass effect in the posterior fossa, and so patients complain of an occipital headache. Um, any lesion in the cerebellum tends to cause nausea, vomiting, and vertigo. They're not able to walk because of ataxia, and the pressure sort of in the back of the head also gives not just a headache, but a stiff neck. And you do your examination, and they're going to have ipsilateral ataxia, if the hemorrhage is, extends more laterally. So remember with cerebellar lesions, the ataxia is always on the same side. If the bleed tends to be more towards the midline, then it will be more of a truncal, wide-based gait instability. So when we have this presentation, um, even though I told you last year in the neuroradiology lecture that um, when we want to look at the posterior fossa, the MRI does a much better job well, in this case, time is of the essence. And so we really want a CT in this case. Because CT, um, even though it doesn't image the posterior fossa very well, it still picks up a hemorrhage um, with a very good sensitivity. So we need to make a diagnosis quickly. We need a CT scan. And so here we can see a hemorrhage in the cerebellum. Okay, again, the, the image quality here is poor. Look at all the lines of artifact here, but you still can't miss that, right? We've got a very obvious hemorrhage. So why is this the most important one not to miss? Well, it's very hard. Let's just say we have here a, um, a hypertensive hemorrhage, like a putaminal hemorrhage. Well, you can't just go in and remove that very easily. Now, there are some new developments, new neurosurgical techniques, but this is very deep much more difficult for a neurosurgeon to try to extract um, the blood there. But with the cerebellar hemorrhage, these are very easy to access. They're superficial, right next to the bone here. And so these patients do very well if they're quickly diagnosed and treated frequently by um, neurosurgical intervention. Now, there are a lot of other things that can cause bleeds in the brain. The big picture is that if you see someone like this, okay, here we've got a hematoma, but where is it? Well, it's frontal lobe, um, you know, it's, it's not in a location of a hypertensive hemorrhage. This is not the putamen, the thalamus, the pons, or the cerebellum. And so if you see someone with a hemorrhage like this in a non-hypertensive 
but not one of those four locations, something else is going on. You need to figure out what it is. So um, I'll never forget my first time as a resident seeing a bleed like this. Okay, and we did an angiogram study. This is not, you know, the patient that I saw, but, and now we see a tangle of blood vessels here. This is called a vascular malformation. So the clue is that this is not a hypertensive hemorrhage, so we need to find out it's some other etiology. Okay, so just a, a few of the more common um, causes, other causes of hemorrhage. So vascular malformations, there are many types of vascular malformations. The one that is most likely to bleed is an arterial venous malformation. And an AVM, the blood vessels are not normal. Okay, they're leaky. And we have these arterial venous connections, but without an intervening capillary network. And so patients have these recurrent little hemorrhages, sometimes can be large. And also these blood vessels are likely to develop um, aneurysm uh, formations, and then these can bleed. And so um, usually this presents somewhere between the ages of 10 and 50 um, with either a hemorrhage or just the mass effect of having that tangle of abnormal bl blood vessels that can irritate cortical neurons and the patient may present with a seizure. So um, overall risk of hemorrhage varies a lot and there are many different factors that will tell us whether this is more likely to bleed or less likely. But overall, the risk of hemorrhage is about 2 to 3% per year. And there are lots of treatments and different things that are certainly beyond the scope of uh, this lecture. But it's important to keep in mind in our differential of patients that present with a bleed in the brain. Okay, And so if we see something like this here at autopsy, very significant collection of abnormal blood vessels here in the temporal lobe. Okay, And so this would almost certainly cause seizures, and a lot of other problems here as this, you know, bleeds and leaks over time. All right, we can also have hemorrhage in the brain due to medications that we give the patient, anticoagulant medications like warfarin. Maybe the patient's in atrial fibrillation, and, um, you know, an elderly individual then falls and hits their head, and, you know, much more likely to bleed in the brain in that situation. Or maybe we've given a patient TPA, for an acute stroke, but we need to watch them very carefully because that can cause bleeding in the brain as a risk factor. Okay, so um, always need to be aware of that in terms of medications. Also, we often see patients that have an ischemic stroke. This patient has a left middle cerebral artery stroke, but notice they've developed these little bright areas here. This is hemorrhage into the stroke. And so when we see something like this with kind of these petechial hemorrhages inside an area of ischemic stroke, so the ischemic stroke is dark, the bleeding is bright, and this suggests that uh, it's somewhat more likely that this may be an embolic stroke. So what happens is, let's say we have a patient with atrial fibrillation. They have a clot. It goes up to the left middle cerebral artery, gets stuck there, and then the patient has a left MCA stroke. Well, the clot may break apart, and then all of a sudden you have a rush of high pressure flow into the left middle cerebral artery vascular territory. And that sudden rush of high pressure flow may then cause bleeding um, in the brain. So if you see something like this, we want to be really primed for um, embolism as the um, etiology. Cerebral, cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Um, is due to amyloid beta, just like we talked about in Alzheimer's disease, where it accumulates now within cerebral blood vessels. And so this usually results in multiple small, often asymptomatic hemorrhages in the brain. And this can be definitely associated with Alzheimer's uh, dementia, but it doesn't have to be. Um, but it does run in parallel, the incidence with the incidence of Alzheimer's. So just like Alzheimer's, very uncommon under the age of 65, same thing with cerebral amyloid angiopathy. And uh, when we talked about the APOE uh, different forms, um, same thing here with cerebral amyloid angiopathy. You want to have the APOE3. So the APOE2 and APOE4 alleles are associated with cerebral amyloid angiopathy. And so um, I didn't tell you there's a specific um, MRI technique here that makes it likely for us to pick these up. 
And so here's an individual who has had multiple small bleeds over time. And so this would be really diagnostic here of cerebral amyloid angiopathy. So I mentioned at the beginning, we have an hour lecture on head trauma coming up. So I'm not going to revisit subarachnoid hemorrhage, subdural and epidural, because we'll get into that in more um, detail. I, I did just want to remind you, Dr. Deich talked about if we see a really bad trauma with lots of bone fractures, that we can have fat emboli. And those go up to the brain and tend to give multiple subcortical um, hemorrhages. Okay, and so we can actually see the fat elements here in the uh, blood vessels. So if we've seen lots of subcortical hemorrhages after head trauma, it's probably uh, fat emboli from bone fractures. All right, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now these are due to the saccular or berry aneurysm. So again, don't get these confused with Charcot-Buchard aneurysms. Those, remember, go into the brain, putamen, thalamus, pons, cerebellum. When saccular or berry aneurysms rupture, they go into the subarachnoid space, okay, not into the parenchyma of the brain. And so these aneurysms form because we have a defect in the media elastical layers of the blood vessel, and so the intima just sl slowly protrudes outward. The larger the aneurysm, there is um, a, a risk of rupture, especially if they get above 10 millimeters. And so overall peak incidence here is between ages of 35 and 65. These are more likely to occur in patients who have hypertension and who smoke, and it's also associated with polycystic kidney disease. All right, so the location tends to be at these bifurcations in the circle of Willis, almost always in the anterior circulation. And that's because the anterior circulation is under higher pressure. Okay, so a drawing that you're uh, familiar with, the three most common locations for these aneurysms are at the anterior communicating artery, at the junction here of the internal carotid artery and the PECOM, and then at the trifurcation of the middle cerebral artery. So notice all three of those are anterior circulation. So only 10% occur here in the posterior circulation. So first of all, very important to know that in general, these aneurysms do not cause symptoms until they rupture. Okay, that's very important because you will certainly have patients that will come in with headaches and they may say, I'm concerned I have an aneurysm. So an aneurysm causes a headache when it ruptures. So it's a once in your life, very severe headache. It wouldn't cause chronic headaches over five years or 10 years or intermittent headaches that would come and go. Okay, it's a once in your life headache. And so <clears throat> it's an acute onset, worst headache of my life. But the more important part here that I underlined is the acute onset because someone that has migraine headaches is gonna have the worst migraine headache of their life. So it is a severe headache but it comes on just in an in instant. Okay, so it's a new headache. I've never had a headache like this before. It comes on in a second. Um, that would give you more of a you know flavor of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So there is increased intracranial pressure, and so we can have confusion, even loss of consciousness at the onset, and sort of even like a pontine hemorrhage with sudden coma and death if there's just a massive increased intracranial pressure from all that blood into the subarachnoid space. Um, somewhat more likely to occur while active. So a step one question may give you someone working out or lifting weights, something like that, and then they develop a severe um, headache. Now, an important distinction from a hypertensive hemorrhage here, the blood goes into the subarachnoid space, and so it's not involving the brain parenchyma. So as a general rule, these patients have a non-focal examination. They don't have a hemiplegia, ataxia, all of that. The one location that has a distinctive focal finding is that internal carotid artery posterior communicating artery junction aneurysm. Because there, when the aneurysm ruptures, the blood pushes up against the third nerve. Okay, because remember, um, here's our internal carotid artery, here's the PECOM, Okay, so we kind of lose it here, but this aneurysm, you know, would tend to be about in this location, and here's the third nerve. Okay, so if we have a PECOM aneurysm, when it ruptures, it's going to give a third nerve palsy. Okay, so the story would be a sudden onset severe headache, 
and then the patient would complain of double vision. And remember, a third nerve palsy is the eye is down and out with severe ptosis and mydriasis. All right, so if we're worried about a subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, our first study is always going to be a head CT. Remember, anytime we're worried about acute hemorrhage, do a CT. All right, and so CT is more than 90%, 95% sensitive. So usually we do not need to go on and do a lumbar puncture, okay, because we're picking up more than 90% of these. But if you really suspect subarachnoid hemorrhage and the CT is normal, then you would go on and do a lumbar puncture to look for those red blood cells, okay? Now, once we've diagnosed a subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, you need to find out where the aneurysm is. So then we do a type of angiogram study, and that can be an MR angiogram study, a CT angiogram study, or a conventional um, angiogram study. All right, so here you can see multiple aneurysms here, one here at the anterior communicating artery. Here's another one out at the trifurcation. Here's another one at the internal carotid. Um, and maybe the best one we see here is actually at the top of the basilar artery. Okay, and here at autopsy, again, very large one at the anterior communicating artery at the trifurcation of the MCA um, here on both sides. So you need to be able to recognize a CT of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So this is kind of a classic one here, massive hemorrhage here that really outlines the midbrain. You can see that blood going out into the sylvian fissure here. And uh, in a really large one, we may see hemorrhage here that extends into the uh, ventricular uh, system. So treatment which I don't expect you to know anything about treatment of a subarachnoid hemorrhage, but there are unique things we do with blood pressure control. We really want a lower blood pressure um, than we would in ischemic stroke. So there are some things we do with fluid management. There's a medication called nimodipine, which is a calcium channel blocker, which uh, has been used for many years with the thought that it uh, acts to reduce vasospasm. That's not entirely clear that that's what it's actually doing, but the outcome is better in patients that are on nimodipine, and so that's um, commonly used. And there are lots of neurosurgical procedures to take care of these aneurysms, but I'm not going to go into that um, in this lecture. All right, and then finally, let's talk a little bit about cerebral venous thrombosis. This is quite unique. The superior sagittal sinus is the most common venous sinus that's affected. And notice that, you know, this is something uniquely occurs in women who are younger, mean age of 37. And so this is associated with oral contraceptive use. And outside of that, it's often pregnancy related, especially during the time immediately after delivery, because there is a hypercoagulable state um, after delivery, you know, and, and maybe there's a little dehydration, which might contribute to that. And so women after delivery are, are somewhat uh, susceptible to this. And so if you have an occlusion of the superior sagittal sinus, well, now you have this arterial blood flow that can't drain adequately, and so there's increased intracranial pressure. And so that increased pressure um, tends to lead to both ischemic and hemorrhagic strokes. And so they tend to line up here along the midline. Okay, we can't really see the superior sagittal sinus here, but um, again, the, the arterial flow can't drain, so it backs up. And so we get areas of ischemia and areas of hemorrhage as well. And so this sort of thing, the presentation, because of the increased intracranial pressure, patients will have headaches, frequently double vision, because remember, in increased intracranial pressure, you involve the sixth nerve, often bilateral sixth nerve. So double vision, visual loss from papilledema, Okay, and again, because of increased intracranial pressure, confusion or encephalopathy is frequently seen. Now, in terms of our neurologic examination, of course, we're going to look for that sixth nerve palsy. We're going to look in the eyes for papilledema. But in terms of weakness, you know, the leg fibers are here in the paracentral lobule. So if we've got these ischemic infarctions along the midline, then women after delivery in this scenario you would not be surprised to see focal leg weakness. And you irritate cortical neurons here, 
uh, they may have seizures as well. So just to remind you what a six nerve palsy looks like, you may not appreciate much here in primary gaze, but as the patient looks to the right, the right eye does not have abduction. They look to the left, the left eye does not have abduction. So bilateral six nerve palsy, that's always very concerning. All right, so if we're thinking about this, our screening test you'd want to do immediately in terms of blood tests is to check for a D-dimer. This uh, assesses fibrin degradation, so it's going to be very sensitive for a cerebral venous uh, thrombosis. And then we'll want to confirm it by doing a venogram study. So here's the superior sagittal sinus, and it should look like this all the way across, right? So we have a thrombosis right here of the superior sagittal sinus thrombosis. And so um, treatment for this is anticoagulation therapy. Okay, what we're trying to do is to recanalize, um, you know, this area of the superior sagittal sinus to try to restore some normal um, arterial venous um, connections.